And so, um, when when the enemy sees the blood, when you plead the blood of Jesus against the enemy, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I minister, I teach this this day, not by my own power and my own strength, but I teach totally dependent on you to teach us, God. As I'm teaching this group, God, you teach me. I pray, God, that you would come. We invite you here. We invite you to sup with us. You said in your word that if we invite you to come in, you will come. And you will come and sup with us. So, God, come with us tonight. Speak to us tonight. Holy Spirit, I yield totally to you. Father, let your kingdom come and let your will be done in our life as we hear with understanding what I'm teaching tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. The power of the blood. That beating that Isabel couldn't stand to watch. That beating that most of you cringed when you looked at. That was supposed to be me. That was supposed to be you. He took that beating for every human being that ever existed, that would ever exist. And that right there, what we could see on that film, wasn't even close. They didn't show you that when he, when, when they was preparing him to go on the cross. I didn't show y'all that, that graphic. They actually had to dislocate his shoulders and they did it as a form of torture. So he couldn't pull himself up. And then they, with the way they drove the nails in his hands, it was just pain, any kind of movement on the cross was pain but all of the blood that was shed when he was being flogged when the bone and sinew was being ripped from his back and ripped from his ribs and and, and the things that was happening all of that blood was shed for every human being but that blood if Satan knew that the blood that he was spilling that was being spilled when Jesus was being beat if he'd have known the access and the power and the authority that that was going to transfer to us as human beings, that was going to transfer to fallen man. If if Satan knew that Jesus was the second Adam and at his death, a whole new realm of royalty and power was going to rise up on the earth, the earth he had defeated when Adam and Eve fell and sinned. When Adam and Eve fell to sin, he defeated the earth. Satan defeated man in the garden. And God sent the thing he, could, he, he defeated to defeat him. So that's why he sent Jesus in the body of a human. Because he G, Satan ruled, he, he took authority over the kingdom of man. And so God sent a man into the earth to reestablish the kingdom of God and reestablish man's position above Satan. That's why in Ephesians, if you read the book of Ephesians, starting in the first in, in the first chapter of Ephesians, uh, right now I'm doing a, a slow study of the book of Ephesians in my own personal time. But if you start in Ephesians chapter one and you work your way on through it, it says here. I think it's in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Um, let's, 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 let's go ahead and just start with verse 1. It says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Every act of disobedience that we move in and we don't repent, we're moving under the spirit and the guidance of Satan. There's two spirits that the Holy Spirit guides God's children and the spirit of disobedience that works through the flesh guides those who don't know God. And the spirit that move works in us and people who, who practice disobedience and reject God, they're being led by the flesh. And, and that is like almost equivalent to being led by the Holy Spirit. For us, you're being led by the flesh, which leads to death. The Holy Spirit leads to life. And so verse three, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and 
of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you were saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus in the ages to come, that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. Let me start right there in verse 7. All of that whooping, all of that, that beating, all of that bleeding that Jesus had to go through was to get you and me back in our right position in heavenly places. I said this before when we first started uh, the ministry of restoration. We first started this ministry. My very first teaching was, who is Jesus? That was the very first message I taught. And in that message, uh, or that teaching series, I talked about when, when Adam and Eve was in the garden and Jesus said, Adam, where are you? This is after Adam had, had eaten of the forbidden fruit, after his wife gave it to him. God didn't say nothing when Eve bit the fruit. But he spoke when Adam did, because Adam represented the headship. He represented the leadership of that family. And so when Adam took a bite in Genesis, God said, Adam, where are you? He said, I heard your voice and I became afraid and I hid myself because I was naked. He said, who told you you was naked? So there was a sense when, G when God asked Adam, where are you? He wasn't asking Adam, where was he? physically because he could see him he knew exactly where he was he was asking him adam where are you because he was no longer seated in heavenly places right. when sin entered we lost our seat in heaven and on the earth we lost our seat of authority in heaven because man was disqualified from heaven through sin because sin cannot heaven cannot inhabit sin so when sin entered the garden in Genesis, man was damned to hell. They were damned to hell. It was, it was, we could not be received by the Father again because sin had entered in. And so when God asked Adam, where are you? He was saying to him, basically, you're not seated with me anymore. I'm a spirit. I'm seated in heavenly places and you're, you are not in your position. And so that's why Jesus died. That's why Easter or, or the resurrection celebration is so important because that was a series. Uh, Jesus' life, three, 33 years of living, but his three years in ministry was so important because that's when, uh, how many people in here ever ran track? Track, track, track. You never ran track before? Well, we ran track and I used to run the 4 by 100 relays and that baton was so important that we could be whipping the other team's butt and we get down to that last man because I always ran third leg. I ran second leg. And when I would get that baton from the first guy, I would build on the lead and hand it to the third man. If that third man dropped that baton, that was it. No matter how, how bad we was winning, it was over. The race was over. And so Jesus, when he decided, God decided to send him to be whipped for man. God decided to send him to be flogged for man. God decided, I'm tired of the, I'm tired of receiving the blood of bulls and lambs. I'm tired of seeing these people, you know, go to hell without any hope. I have to send someone to restore order to the earth. And so he sent, listen to me, he sent an apostle to the earth. An apostle that represented the kingdom of God was sent from heaven into the earth. Now, what was he sent from heaven into the earth for? He was sent in from heaven into the earth to die. He was born to die. He was born to bleed. He was born to suffer. But he was also born to raise up and to train disciples. He was also born to colonize the earth again. 
But he he wasn't gonna colonize the earth by himself. He colonized the earth with a team he was raising up, and then that team raised up another team, and that team raised up another team, and they started a whole big culture, a movement for Christ. And the discipleship, and the family, and how we're sitting around the table and we eating today, this is how the movement of Christ began. It began with the lead teacher. It began with participants who who believed in the teachings. Of the, of the of the of the apostle which was Jesus and they and and they believed so much in what he was teaching they were willing to just as he came to die they were willing to die to see what he started in them pass to the next generation and so they weren't gonna let the baton be dropped in their generation and they passed it to the next generation and then the next generation had to gird up their loins and prepare themselves for the work and prepare themselves to raise up disciples and to, to demonstrate the word, but also pass it on in tradition and pass the baton to the next generation. And now the baton has been passed to us. Us 30-somethings. Us 40-somethings. Well, you know 40-somethings here, but, but, but us 30-somethings and 40s. We are the ones holding that third leg baton. The body of Christ in this United States of America is under attack. And we are one generation away. Listen to me. We are one generation away from going backwards in the church. What would it be like if the church is not strong as angels coming up? There's no strong church presence. There's no strong men and women of God to, to stand up for him. I'm talking about Angel Jr. What is the world going to look like? How would it look for... Elijah, if there's no Pastor Little, if there's no uh, 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 um, Jotney, there's no Toy, you guys, if there's no other wave coming up with him, what does the world look like? Already there, you know, women can marry women. Already he just, how old is Elijah? Two. He too. And already at two, men can marry men. Women can marry women. Men can change their physical and biological structure and look like a woman. And women can change their DNA and look like a man. <clears throat> this world, as we know it, is in trouble. But God. But me. But you. That's what this is about. Me coming together on, Sunday, on Wednesdays and teaching. That's what this is all about. Me answering the call. To pastor and to lead. That's what it's all about. Me taking a, a, a regress back to continue to get prepared so that I'm able to stand without turning back, without relenting. I'm able to stand and go with the full endowment of the power of God to establish this. And this is not just about me, but it's about we. And guys, with me saying all of that, we have to wake up. We are in a war. Every second of the day, we are either gaining ground for the kingdom of God or we are losing ground. Every second of the day. So when you're thinking about your little life, the big scheme of things for why God put you here is either going to hell in the handbasket or is gaining progressive ground. And so when I give you guys things to study, study it to show yourself approved. Why? Because a day and a time that you're living in, you need to be ready to be used by God right now. You need to be, you need to be ready to be a strong tower. You need to be ready to be someone that's strong, that knows how to stand up and know how to use the weapons of our warfare, which are not carnal. And know how to teach and know how to dispatch the power and the blood of the, of the lamb. We need it. We need that blood. That's the reason why Jesus stood back up and bowed his back. Because they needed it. We needed every stripe he took. And we needed every block, every drop of blood he dropped. We needed it. I'm going to verse 12. I'm going to start in verse 11. Therefore, remember that you once, that you once Gentiles, in, therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called, I'm sorry, who are called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. Verse 12, that, that at the time you were without Christ, 
being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, Jesus, who once were far off, those who were once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. They weren't brought near by preaching and teaching. They were brought near by the blood. And guess what? If we're going to win souls for Christ, if we're going to win our families, if we're going to win our children, if we're going to if we're going to decree and declare that AJ is going to grow up and he's going to be a man of God, he's going to be a man that fears God, you, you, you're you going to have to plead the blood of Jesus for him every single day. You're going to have to fight a good fight of faith against the enemy because the enemy is never going to stop coming after him. He's never going to stop coming after you, Toya, you, Jotney, you, Kim, me, Monica. He's never going to stop coming after us. As a matter of fact, he's going to come after us harder because we we represent the kingdom of God and he wants to shut our mouth. He's going to come after you harder. Every backslidden person who's living a double life, who, who won't repent, when they go to hell, their punishment is worse than the average person. Because Satan uses retribution to pay them back for every day they spoke against his kingdom. Every day they spoke and led people to Christ. And on the flip side, every person who goes to heaven, who lives and fights a good fight of faith and walks according to the principles of God and yields your life to live for God's purposes, you're blessed. Every prayer you prayed at six o'clock. Every prayer you prayed at five, every prayer, every prayer we prayed together as a team, we get rewarded for because we gave heaven access to coming to the earth. We gave heaven the ability to affect, uh, you know, this community and the surrounding areas and our families in ways we do not know. And so we're going to be rewarded or punished for things we do or we don't do. But one thing I don't want you to be doing while I'm teaching about the blood and guys, you guys can go ahead and read. Uh, Ephesians, I, I challenge you to, to do a slow reading through the book of Ephesians. It's going to talk about the authority we have in Christ. It's going to talk about us being seated with God in heavenly places. And so the blood of Jesus, it sets us in our rightful place in God. But the blood of Jesus, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to um, share some scriptures with you guys that denote what the blood brings into into our life. Uh, as I I'm going to read them and give you the scripture, you just write it down. Okay, this one, this is Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. If you are a Christian today, you have to know this. Just like you know uh, 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 what color you are. Just like you know how much money you have in the bank. Just like you know uh, 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 that it's, it's nighttime. Just like you know anything else that is real. You have to know this word and hide it in your heart. You have to know this. So Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The soul is our mind, will, and our emotion. Our mind, our will, and our emotions will send us straight to the pits of hell. But God, but the blood. The blood. When we plead the blood of Jesus over our over our families, over our finances, we plead the blood of Jesus over ourselves every day. What we're doing is we're releasing the life of Jesus, the life of God to stand up for us. The blood of Jesus is not dead. It's alive. And so when the enemy approaches you, Jotney, because whether you guys are doing it, and I meant to ask you guys how many people had start doing what I said on Saturday. All, every day this week, you've been doing it. How many people just show hands? I'm not, I, I, and, and that's good if you've done it one or two days or three or four days. But I, I need you guys to commit to doing this. I'm trying to activate you and move you out of uh, stagnance, move you out of being paralyzed, move you out of being a uh, 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 reactive to being proactive. So I hope you guys wrote down Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Leviticus chapter 17. Uh, verse 11. Now, uh, you know, the, the blood of Jesus, um, like I said, the blood of Jesus is alive and that blood atones and washes away our sin. Now, the next passage is Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. Matthew chapter 20, 
6, verse 28. It says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remissions of sin. That's Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that washes away sin. Not praying to Mary, uh, not getting some rosary beads and holding them and going and talking to a, 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 um, a priest. Th those things don't save you. Those things, you know, the confession or going to confess your sin to a priest in a booth. That does nothing but humiliate you. It does nothing but, pr but, but practice you in religious traditions, religious ritual. But those rituals cannot give you the access and, and cannot lead you to remission and atonement for your sin. The only action that leads to the uh, uh, atonement of sin is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And the only thing that covers our sins and washes it away is the blood. Hebrews 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. It says, and almost all things are by law, by the law, purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. I'm going to read that again. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. In the Old Testament, everything that they needed to be purged, the sins of the people, the sins of the city. They killed something. They had to kill something. Uh, they had to make a sacrifice before the Lord because it required blood. That's why, listen to me, that's why when people are murdered in the streets, when people are being murdered, the witches and warlocks, they run out to these areas where people are being uh, uh, bombed and, and, and blood of, 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 of humans are left uh, out on the street, they go out and they scoop that blood up. That blood, they go out and they perform rituals with that blood. The blood, if they can't, if they can't get the blood of, and even Satan, <laughs> he's just a mimicker of God. He requires, because a blood sacrifice, just think about it, when you were, when you were not saved. And I remember when I was in middle school and people were making blood, you know, blood covenant sacrifices like friends and they would cut themselves. And, you know, and, and, and it was a t they didn't understand, but that was something very spiritual. And they were making covenants of connections. This is my girl. We, you know, or this is my this is my my guys. They made blood covenants and they killed for those things. They They really believed in it. And in the kingdom of darkness, he requires blood. And if people in the satanic realm cannot get the blood of humans, they will go and get the blood of an animal. And they will make a sacrifice unto Satan. Satan wants that. He wants worship. And the greatest form of worship that he can get is a blood sacrifice. Because a blood sacrifice, like, like the scripture says, the life of the person is in the blood. And that is the, that is the deepest form of, 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 of appreciation and oh. Just to just to have some kind of a blood sacrifice in the blood of people. That means these, these blood sacrifices, you know, I, 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 I'm mocking God right now and I'm taking his glory and I'm usurping it for myself, and especially the blood of a person who don't know God. That blood is a sign that I got their souls. And so, and so the blood of uh, 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 the blood covenant is extremely important, guys. I want you to make much about the blood. We have to understand that blood that was shed on Calvary. It was a blood, you know, we ought to just thank God right now for his blood. Mm -hmm. Father, you are holy. I, I thank you for your blood, God. I thank you for the power that comes into my life because of your blood. I thank you for the sin that is not seen because of your blood. I thank you for the authority that's given to me through the blood. I thank you, God, for, for, um, 
uh, 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 the ability to stand under your protection because of the blood. I thank you, God, that you justified me by your blood. I just thank you, God. First John chapter one, verse seven. First John chapter one, verse seven. I'll give you guys a few seconds to, to get to that. I'm going to go ahead and read it for you here. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us of all sin. Now, let me help you understand this. Every Christian is covered under the blood. When God sees you, Jotney, he don't see... He don't see you, Jotney. He sees the blood of his son that covers you. That was That's what gives you access to enter his presence to pray. In the, New, in the Old Testament, you couldn't even come in to pray. A priest had to do it for you. <clears throat> but at Jesus' death, the Bible says the, the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom. So no longer were we are far off from God. We can walk in intimate relationship with him. And when he sees all of us around this table, God sees, the father sees the blood of his son. And that's what makes us righteous. That's what makes us acceptable in his sight. You see what I'm saying? And, 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 and it's a thing. Now, I want you to understand this. I want you to get this. When you practice disobedience in your life, the Holy Spirit is unctioning you. You know, you need to stop doing that. <coughs> You, you know, you need to slow down, Johnny. You know, you're having a little too fast, Eric. You know, you, you, need, you, need, you need to, to, to slow, slow that temper down. Don't be so ready to, to, to jump, you know, to, to 10, you know. I ain't going to say no names there. Jump to 10. Slow your roll. And the Holy Spirit just keep giving you that unction and you ignore it. You move in disobedience. And when you move in disobedience and, you, and then you act in that disobedience, you're no longer covered. It's God's grace, but you step out from under you, you almost deactivate the power of the blood in your life. But the thing that makes God so awesome is his mercy. His new mercies he, cre he, he establishes. It's his blood that creates that fountain of mercy for us every day. Because that blood continues to flow over our life. So even when we move in disobedience, his mercy says, but. My mercy is kind toward you. I'm going to let you see the weapon that was going to form, but I'm not going to let it prosper. <coughs> like when my, I had a problem with anger and rage, and I'm in the car in North Carolina, driving with a baby in the back seat, an innocent, sweet little baby who didn't have no nothing to do with my with my sin. But the Holy Spirit kept telling me, you know, you can't be road dogging people on the road, Eric. <coughs> And this man pulled out this big, gigantic, long <clears throat> handgun and pointed it at the back of my head behind me in the car. Then he tried to pull up on the side of me so he could either wave his gun at me or shoot at me from the side because he was so angry. And I didn't even know the man had a gun in the car. You know, I was up on my high horse and he was on my tail and I slammed on brakes. And when he almost hit me, then he lost it. He lost it. But thank God for his mercy, who calls the truck driver, who sits up high and looked down low and saw what was happening, who pulled his truck next to me and wouldn't let the guy get next to me. And he stayed there until the guy rolled around. And the Lord said, I let that woman form, but I didn't let it prosper. Because my mercy stepped in and said, not today, Mr. Postman, not today. But when I move in disobedience consistently and we don't repent, then we almost de we almost deactivate by, by our own will the power of the blood, or we weaken. I'm gonna put this right here. We weaken the power of the blood, and there's something called a hedge. The blood forms a hedge around us, but when we live in unrepentant sin in our life, holes form or breaks happen in the hedge, and when breaks happen in the hedges. The enemy can, can, can have an access 
through that hedge to attack our life. That's why the Bible says give no room to the enemy. Because all he needs is a space and an opportunity. And for you to live in a, in a way that's displeasing to God consistently enough that he can reach out and touch. And everything he touched, he destroys. And so, guys, it's important um, that we not only boast in the blood, but we have to live to the best of our ability in obedience to God's word. Now, we're not saved by we're not sa oh, we're not saved by works. We're saved by the grace of his blood that came through the blood of Jesus. But he still requires us to pursue righteousness. What does Isabel, you 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 know that scripture so good. What's Matthew 633? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Yes, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So when we pursue a life of righteousness and covering under the blood, you, you know, we still have to pursue righteousness. Even though we're saved by grace, we still have to pursue. We have to seek after. We have to live consistently pursuing righteousness. So we can't, we can't, I'm coming out of the blood, but you live like hell. You know what I'm saying? You, you can't, you can't, you can't do that. I mean, literally, you live like hell. You talk like hell. You you walk like hell. You, you think like hell. Hell is the total opposite of the kingdom. Instead of walking by faith, you walk by fear. That's living like hell. Instead of standing in the authority of Christ and instead of you walking in obedience to what, what I'm teaching you, you you're standing on, and the, on the power of the blood and you're covering yourself. You're getting yourself ready for war. In, in, in Exodus, like I told you guys on Saturday, when the children of Israel were instructed to put the blood over the doorpost, Jotney, could you tell me how it was, how, how, how did... How did Moses instruct them to, to ready themselves? I'm thinking he told them to put the blood on the door. But I know I just said that, but I'm saying how did Moses instruct the people? How did God instruct the people through Moses to prepare themselves while they was putting oh, the blood? Oh. Say it loud now. Staff, shoes, position, the ram, um, <laughs> Yes. That so they had to have a belt, they had to have their shoes on, they had to have their staff. You don't have your staff unless you're ready to go somewhere. And so we have to understand that when we get up and start our day, we have to get up ready for battle. We have to get up ready for the unexpected. And we have to get up using the weapons that God has given us, using every advantage we have. Every advantage. And there's an advantage we have with the blood. Boast in the blood. Use it. Use it. Don't get up and not cover yourself in the blood daily. Don't go to bed without covering yourself, your home, your property in the blood. We need it. It's like don't get on a boat without a life jacket. Because just in case the boat go down, at least I can float. I won't be in the water. I have to pray for the blood to cover me that no sharks will bite me. But at least, but the, the, but the blood is more powerful than that life jacket. We can't go home. We can't leave home without it. We can't go to sleep without it. The blood, the blood. I can't emphasize that enough. Why am I emphasizing that right now? Why is the spirit of God leading me and leading people, you know, all over this world to, to boast on the blood? Because listen to me, the church is under persecution. The church is under persecution. The, the, the laws and the principles of God's kingdom in America is under persecution. We are a nation that boasts in Christianity, but we live like hell. We are we have double lives. We are a government and a country that has a double life. And God is about to step Ichabod over this nation. If we, if but but what did God tell Abraham? What did Abraham say? God, if there's just five people in Sodom, will you save it? He said, yeah, if it's five, I, I, I'll, I'll save the whole nation if it's five of them in there. And then he, then he thought about that thing. He said, well, if, it, if it's three, <laughs> you know, God, let me, you know, just let me break this down to three. I, I know about them. That's some sinful jokers. God, it, let, okay, I'm going to take that back. Three. Okay, Moses, if it's three, <laughs> I'll save the city. How do you know that city wasn't saved? <laughs> but God was willing to save a whole city for three people. 
You mean he would salvage a whole city for the righteous, three righteous people? This nation can be salvaged if the church in this nation commits to righteousness. If the people who represent the church stand in using the weapons and using the privileges we've been given to stand against the enemy, three people can save this city from being overrun by demons. Three! Three people could do it. If God would save the most sinful city in the, that the world has ever known, other than the what's going on in America right now, for three people, what can three people do in Deltona? I told y'all, don't fret, because we're not 100 people. Three people could save a nation. Three people can, 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 turn, can turn heaven on full tilt in Deltona. Three righteous people who cry out to the Lord. And so you have to understand that when you leave your home and you go to your job, there are people that's not saved there. And they need the benefit of the blood. They need it in their life. And that's why we can't have a shut mouth. We have to open our mouth. Because I can boast in the power that comes with the blood that we have a right to. But it's sad and it's selfish and it's horrible. I bet the angel says a sign to every Christian stands and just utter disgust and sadness that we never share. We never talk about this blood. We never talk about the benefit of the blood. We know. We know the benefit. Everything I'm teaching y'all, everything you learned before you got to me. When you when you come up in your in that school, John, and you come up with you come up in that school with all of this knowledge in you. And if you don't say, if this whole year has gone by and you ain't said not one thing to one teacher, God is giving you moments in the break room, laughing, talking. Who have you talked to about the benefit of the blood? Man, I want to talk to you about some benefits, man. I want to see your life blessed. And you ain't got to, you know, you ain't got to receive this, but I, I, I got to talk to you about because I'm so excited about some great things that's happening in my life. People that are excited, that really know what they got, they talk about it. Every chance I get, you know, when I'm talking to people, I bring my wife up. I, I, I bring her up. I bring her into the conversation. Sometimes you know how it is when you love somebody. You always seem to bring them into the conversation. We ain't even talking about them. Why you brought the why you brought her? We ain't talking about your wife. Why you brought her up? Because you love them. And anything that you're excited about, you will find a way to bring it up in a conversation. Aren't you aren't you excited about the benefits? Aren't you excited that you're not the one on that cross getting beaten? But see, Jesus beaten only lasts for some hours. But the whipping we would take in hell would last for an eternity. And so Jesus left eternity to take the worst beating ever known to man, to shed his blood so that we didn't have to take a beating for all eternity separated from God without no hope. And then we wouldn't have to live on the earth being assaulted, being attacked by the enemy without any defenses. Jesus, thank you, Lord. You see what I'm saying to you? And so... Guys, you ought to see the value of what having Christ in your life means enough to share that news with someone else. Now, after this, after I leave this teaching on the blood, God told me to teach on hell. I have a book this thick that's that that's company with my with the Bible. This Bible tells us everything we need to know about hell. But most Christians don't know what the Bible says about hell. There are some Christians who don't even, didn't even know that the Bible talked about hell in detail in the Bible. But you, an ambassador of Christ, you who are ambassador of Christ to, to Elijah, you are ambassador of Christ to to angel. You're an ambassador of Christ to your nieces and nephews. You're an ambassador of Christ to those students. Johnny is an ambassador. We are ambassadors of Christ. We have to know what the Bible says. It's not just about God is not interested solely in us having a good, happy life. He knows the plans he has for us. Jeremiah 29 11 states that. Plans to prosper us and give us a hope in the future. But what 
his part of his plan is is that you and I, one, would understand the benefits that we have through his death, burial, and resurrection and through the relationship we have with Christ, that we would activate it in our life, but we would teach other people. And our life would be an open demonstration for them to watch and to see. And so, guys, that's why I'm teaching, I'm teaching on this. I'm, I'm gonna give you a couple more scriptures and I'm gonna close out. This is this is so so important, guys. If you don't if if we don't understand, reason why I'm taking my time to talk about the benefits of the blood, because I want to stir up an excitement in you and a deep sense of gratefulness to God because of you having this benefit in your life. Ephesians chapter one verse seven said, and I've, I've shared this with you guys already, in whom we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace toward us. I'm going to read this other scripture. You guys can go and read these. We can pull them up now or you can you can you can read them. Now, the blood of Jesus bring gives us atonement. You should have I want you to number one through ten. Once I give you these ten uh, scriptures to support these ten things, then. That, that's going to be your study guide for you to study until you know these things because I can only give it to you. You have to study and apply it in your life. Number one, the blood of Jesus it gives is life. You write down Genesis chapter 9, verse 4, and Leviticus chapter 17, verse 14. Both of these scriptures are going to speak to the blood of Leviticus chapter 17, verse 14, and Genesis chapter 9, verse 4. Write down the blood is life, and then run those two scriptures. And then in your own time, look those scriptures up and, and, and commit them to memory. Number two is atonement. The blood gives you right to atonement, A-T-O-N-E-M-E-N-T. -E -E now, G, now the, the scriptures here also that speaks a little of atonement is just like in number one, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, and Romans chapter five, verse 11. Number three, the blood of Jesus gives us access to forgiveness. You can find scriptural support for that statement in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 12. And Acts chapter 13, verse 37. See how I'm giving this to y'all? You can actually you can actually sit and talk to somebody about the benefits of God. And by the time you get to number 10, you can say, do you want these benefits in your life? <laughs> and you can lead them right to Christ. Number four is reconciliation. Reconciliation. Do you know that every person that's not covered under the blood of Jesus Every person does not, that does not confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, God sees them as his enemy, and he sees them with the wrath of God. The wrath of God is set toward them. But when we come into relationship with God, God reconciles us to peace. And peace, he sees us through the eyes of peace and not wrath. Now, he sees all people through the, the eyes of compassion, but also wrath, because the wrath is not against the person, it's against the sin. He hates sin. And anybody that don't have Jesus' blood covering them lives and represents a sinful nature, and he hates that. He don't hate the people. He hates the sin. Uh, reconciliation. Uh, write down Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Colossians, C-O-L-O-S-S-I-A-N. Colossians number 1, verses 20 through 21. Number five, through the blood, we receive redemption. God redeems us. 
We were lost and he retrieves us. He picks us up from Satan's side and he brings us to his side. The blood switches, causes you to switch teams. He was on the, he was on the blue team. But when the blood hits you, you're on the red team now. So you cross over. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. Sanctification, number six, is sanctification. It sanctifies us. The blood sanctifies us. It gives us active access to sanctification, meaning that you become acceptable. You, you are set apart. God actually sets you apart and say, oh, this is my family. This, 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 these are my people right here. My blood sanctifies you. It pulls you out from among. So when stuff hits your job and people are getting fired all around, around you and God keeps your job is because you sanctified. He put you over here with his team. And so the curse don't affect you because because mm -hmm. anything I bless, Satan can't curse. Mm -hmm. And they said, what's going on with you, man? How is it that you ain't getting fired? I'm sanctified, baby. I told you. <laughs> you I asked you, did you want to be on the team? <laughs> you want to be on the red team? <laughs> the red team is, is blessed. And, and, and sanctification, it does that for us, okay? It makes us holy. Um, number seven. No, you didn't give me the scriptures. Uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't find a well, it's in there, but I, I didn't. That's one I hadn't done yet. But I promise you, if you if you if you read Ephesians and Galatians, you will you will you will run all up into those. Okay, Ephesians and Galatians, they, it's basically the benefit. It's kind of like a new employee handbook. When you get saved, you just send people to Ephesians and Galatians, and that's the new that's the new believer handbook. It tells you all about your authority. It tells you all about the Spirit and what you gain access to. Ephesians and Galatians. Okay, number seven is justification. We talked about that. I want y'all to remember that. Justifications. If I break it down in three syllables for all us teachers in here, it's justified. Justified. Ooh, I like that. Just if I did never sin. Just as I never slapped that person. Just as I never went to that bad website. Just as I never went and slept them girls. This is he looks at me and he don't see that. Y'all do. Y'all remember that, but he don't. So I can walk in pride from a person from a person that, that have lived a life of sin. That's why we see Saddam Hussein. But if Saddam Hussein bent his knee and said, God, forgive me of this sin that I committed against mankind, then God sees him and justifies him. And he sees him and sees him just as if he did not do none of the stuff he did. You know, some people got mad when Jeffrey Dahmer got led to Christ. Jeffrey Dahmer, who was eating people, got led to Christ in, in prison. He got murdered in prison, too. But the thought of the fact that Jeffrey Dahmer, this man who eats people, now he won't he gonna, he gonna confess Christ. I dare him try to cling to God now. Who the freak are you? This man need to, you know, if we put a magnifying glass and a film up that play what you've been doing and what you done done your whole little life, it's just as bad. Sin is sin. God don't look at death and say, well, he eat people. Oh, that's a real bad sinner. But if you lie all the time and you, you fornicating all the time and you doing all this stuff that God hate, he hate that just like he hate people being killed. So it's no differ, if no differentiation between the two. Sin is sin. And God will justify you if you confess your sins. Romans 5 and 9 is the scripture reference that connects with that. <clears throat> God, thank you for justifying me. Mm, 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 mm. I need justification every day. All them don't, but God, I do. <clears throat> Number eight. The blood is an object of our faith. I go to sleep in peace because I have faith that when I plead the blood of Jesus over my home and over my wife and over myself, we are protected. So the blood is an object of our faith. We're supposed to set our faith in the blood. When you get sick, the first thing you should not do, if the first thing you do is, oh, oh, baby, get the phone and call 911. Mm -mm. Baby, lay your hands on me. Pray for me. Plead that good blood over me. Let's, let's, come against the, let's come against this right now. Let's bind this right now. We have to set our faith in the blood. Nothing is more powerful than that. Okay? And that, and that can be supported by Romans chapter 3, verses 24. 25 and 28. Romans chapter 3, verses 24, 25, and 28. Also, Romans chapter 5, verse 9. 
That is for the object of faith. The blood is the object of faith. Number nine. Number nine. I'm almost done, guys. Access. The blood of Jesus gives us access. We cannot enter the kingdom unless we come through the door, which is Jesus. And we don't have access to come to the door, which is Jesus, if he did not die and shed his blood. So the blood of Jesus gives us access to come through the door, which is Jesus, into the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. Number 10. Number 10, victory. We gain victory. We are victorious. The blood, uh, it clarifies our victory. The blood gives us victory over the enemy. Victory. It's kind of like, you know, some guys ganging up and want to fight me. And the biggest, baddest beast in the neighborhood that comes and steps out next to me at the last minute. And they say, oh, it's ultimate victory. Let's go back the other way. We can't get in the day because, 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 J.C. with him. Oh, dang it. He got J.C. with him. That's an automatic victory. Oh, he got Michael Jordan on his team. That's automatic victory. Jesus is more powerful and more of an ace in the hole than anything we could ever put our faith in. And so when the blood of Jesus comes into our life, in the eyes of Satan, it's already a lost cause. The only hope he have is if you can, if you practice disobedience, if you live a double life and you don't, or you don't take the things that Pastor Little is telling you and activate it. That's his only hope. But if you if you're pursuing righteousness, you're pursuing a life that's pleasing to God, you you're studying to show yourself approved and you're activating your faith through prayer. You're activating the, and you're tapping into the power of the blood by, by pleading the blood over yourself, you know, and you and you putting that active activating that power in your life every day and every morning. He sees you and says, man, listen, listen, listen. Hey, y'all demons us on Isabel. Leave her alone, man. Y'all they, they telling the devil, man, we can't touch her. She talking about the blood and, and she's trying to live right and she don't stop cussing now. And she ain't giving us no room to come into her life. The devil said, that's cool, man. Go to the next person. Oh, she is self-checking them up. So all you who, who Isabel, just watch it from a distance, but to attack this one. And just watch it from a distance now. Because if she opens the door, then you got her. But if she don't, then you're just wasting your energy. But just keep, keep your eyes on her. So he puts a familiar spirit or watching spirits to watch you, watch you, and watch you. And, and to tempt you and tempt you. And the Bible says when the enemy comes, if you resist him, he must flee. And when he flees, he goes and say, man, can you can you give me some re can you give me some reinforcements? Can you can can doubt that? I need doubt to attack her mind. I, I need I need weariness. I need her to grow weary and well doing and something to get that wall down, something to give me access. And so that's why you have to stay committed. You have to stay committed and you got to press for it. And the Bible tells us not grow weary in well-doing. We got to forgive. We, got, we can't go to bed with, you know, listen to me. Unforgiveness is sending more Christians to hell than you can shake a stick at. We can't be Christians. We can't be professors of the way and don't forgive people. We have to be the most merciful and forgiving people because God has forgiven us. We can't hold nobody to anything. And so I, 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 I'm going to bring uh, what I was teaching tonight to a close. I've given you enough. Yes, sweetie. Revelations chapter 12, verse 11. Number 10, uh, the scripture for that, that supports that is Revelations chapter 12, verse 11. Isabel, you mind reading Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 right quick? Let's go in on a victory note. Sure. Read it nice and loud. Read it like you got some power. 12, 11? Yes, read it. Read! <laughs> And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. See? They overcame by the blood. We have ultimate victory through the blood. But you cannot love your life. You've got to let your life go. The Bible says that he who seeks to save his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for the sake of the kingdom, you gain it. And what that means is you got to stop focusing on what, how, how the sacrifice that God is calling for you to make, the obedience God is calling for, how it's going to affect your plans. It's not about me. It's about him. 
I was telling God today, Lord, I'm 40 years old. I don't know how much more time I got. Some people are thinking, oh, I got, I got another year. I got five years. I don't know how much time I got. But God, while I am still breathing, whatever you want from me, just tell me. Grace me to hear you and let me walk in obedience. I must fulfill the work of him who sent me. Even if I don't get no kids, I must fulfill the work of him who sent me. Even if I move and I got to move again, I must fulfill the work of him who sent me. It's not about my plans. The Bible says many are the plans in the heart of man. But only the God's will is the only God's will will be established. I don't want my will to be established, God. I want your will to be established because if my will is established, then I'm established in disobedience. I'm established and I'm not in your perfect will. I don't want my will to be established. I want your will to be established because I want to be able to say what my big brother said. It is finished. And I want the devil to be able to say, thank you, God, it is finished. But what are we going to do with them jokers that he done left? And what are we going to do with the jokers Jockney left? And what are we going to do with the ones Toya left? And what are we going to do with the ones Isabel's left? What are we going to do with the ones Kim left? And Monica and Chica? What are we going to do with them? I want the devil to be so worried that he looks like a gray beast when I see him. <laughs> just from the church, just weighing him out. He just stretched out. I don't know what to do. This church got stronger, and I thought it was getting weaker. But we have the power, Jotney. Y'all, we have the power to establish another strong leg that can pass the torch to the next generation. But we can't do it if your little life is so important. Your little life can end tomorrow. And your plans and what you want to do, all it won't mean nothing. Just found out today that the football player that went to jail, you know, had, you know, for killing somebody who played on the, the New England Patriots, hung himself in a cell. Aaron Hernandez is dead. And I'm not celebrating that. I'm not celebrating a man who commits suicide who don't know that if he did commit suicide, he thought he was getting a, he was finding a way out. I don't want to spend my life in prison. I can't bear it, so I'm killing myself. Not knowing that if he didn't know Jesus and he took his life, the mere fact that he took his life, he he said, God, you, you can't protect me, God. You're not enough. I'm going to take my life into my own hands. And he took his life. Now this man is in prison for all eternity. When I go speak to my brother, I tell my brother's in prison, I said, man, this is a lot of affliction. If it took you being put in prison, to get you into the redeeming blood of the Lamb, hallelujah. That's worship. Because I would have would, would, would live with many days of peace knowing that when your day come to leave this earth, my brother is not in prison anymore. Or when he gets out, my brother is not living under bondage anymore. He is truly walking in the liberty and power. I will be able to say, you know, you know, God, thank you, you know, you know, you know, that you allowed me to repent and you allowed me to. To, to live the best life I could live, hanging on to the cross and hanging on to Jesus. I want to be able to stand over people and not have to lie over them. I've preached over family members and I I didn't know where they was at. Because I didn't know where their life was, but I don't know where they were before they confessed Christ. But we don't want to live at the last minute. We don't know. Guys, I'm telling you, the power of the blood is real. Activated in your life, activated in your family's life, and share the benefits with others. I just gave you 10 benefits of the blood. Share it with other people. Get it locked on the inside of you. I'm going to give you guys a little tool. I'm going to give you a little tool. It's the evangelist in me rising up. Get a small index card and number 1 through 10 and write down the 10 Benefits that I just told you from the blood and the scripture that's sitting next to you, that, that's set, you know, that, that, that they can go to. Print up one and put it in your wallet. And at any moment, Isabel says she's an insurance. <laughs> she, she, she deals in insurance. But she definitely is, all of us are insurance brokers. At any moment, on your lunch break, on the way from home, you can say, I'm going to spend 30 minutes and just... I'm going to spend 30 minutes just talking to people about you know, life insurance. I'll even make up some cards. 
I'll make up some real professional cards with them 10 benefits on it and just give it to you. So this is what you gain access to. Can I talk to you about some benefits, benefits that come only if you know Christ? Because you know, I mean, like I said, guys, if we don't open our mouth and share the gospel, we're just some selfish little people. Let's not be that way. Father, you're holy and you're awesome. Thank you for this day. Thank you for what you have said to us. God, I feel your presence with us. I thank you, God, for speaking to me. God, let us not be those that hear but do not do. God, I ask you to forgive us of all of our sin. If there's any unforgiveness in this group, God, toward anybody here and toward anybody in their family, I pray, God, that you cause them to go to those people and release them of that debt. And when they release them of that debt, as you taught us in prayer, forgive us of our trespasses. Listen, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And so our forgiveness is linked to our willingness to forgive others. And so, Father, I pray that that would not be an offense that's brought against this group, or against my life. And God, if it is anything that's in our heart that needs to be revealed, make sure we know it, God. So, God, I just ask you to let this word bring forth fruit and fruit that remains in the lives of the hearer and in the lives of those that will listen to it by way of YouTube and Facebook and every way that it goes out. God, you be glorified. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And Heavenly Father, I pray no retaliation against the word that has been shared tonight against our pastor and against each and every one of us as we share this awesome word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.